Well, thank you, Oliver, for the uh, introduction. And I have to admit, as the first person following Keith, that is a hard act to follow. Um, this, my talk today is basically uh, comes in a couple of different forms. Um, first off, I want to talk a little bit about decentralized science, of course, but I also want to talk about how we've gotten to where we are today. So if we take a look at this, there's probably not a lot of surprises on this chart. Um, our field is really quite young in many respects. Uh, we've only been working on what you would call longevity science probably in about the past 30 years. And if you look back at some of this stuff, you probably recognize some of the faces. There's some very foundational research that's been done, and this would be people like Craig Venter and Nir Barisly and people like that. But also, after about 10 years, we ended up getting into talking about aging as a disease and that sort of modality. And now, come forward another 10 years, and we've, now, we've changed the narrative. We now talk about things like health span. And there's another group of people who believe that we should talk about longevity. But the key thing that I want to point out here is that if you look prior to, say, 2014, most of the people that were talking about aging research and longevity were of the scientific nature. And starting in around 2014, you started to see people come from outside the field and become interested in longevity. You started to see people starting to advocate a lot more. Um, and certainly, a lot of that advocacy started with people like Aubrey de Grey, the Ending Aging, Methuselah Foundation, SENS Research, and so on and so forth. And of course, Lifespan.io. So what is some of the constraints that we're dealing with here? And from our perspective, or my perspective, there's really three main things, which is resource scarcity, incentive design, and leadership. And I want to start first with resource scarcity. So the first thing is NIH funding. The NIH is probably the most, it is definitely the largest funder of longevity research and health research in the world. Yet, despite that fact, the NIH has limitations. If you look at the funding from the NIH, only one in five applications get, will actually succeed. And that's not a fault of the NIH. They actually have 24, 25 billion dollars uh, each year that they put out. But if you look at the number of applications, it's gone from somewhere around 25,000 almost to 60,000 applications. So there's only so much money to go around. And so with that type of competition, how do researchers actually move the needle forward? And so one of the things that we need to talk about is some misaligned incentives that happen. So the first one is that researchers, to get funding, need to be published. And one of the challenges that DSI actually intends to help resolve is the publisher parish paradigm. So the reality is, is that to get published, you need to go through a process, do your research, and go through a review, go through the peer review process, and get published. And that citation will help you get funding later on down the road. But the problem is peer review creates bottlenecks. It creates gatekeepers. And those gatekeepers first is to get a paper reviewed, you actually have to find reviewers. And that is actually can be quite challenging. And if you've been watching uh, some of the media that's come out recently, uh, peer review has become this sort of abused process in some respects because most peer reviewers are never compensated for all of those hours that they put into peer review. And as a result, um, a lot of publishers are making record profits, but the people that are actually doing the peer review, the scientists that are actually saying that this research is legitimate and should be looked at, are not getting anything in return. So the incentives are broken. And then one of the other things is if you try to get funding for research outside of the typical NIH grant process, it's sometimes challenging to find people who are willing to fund research at the basic research level. It's okay if you're talking about translational because you can make an immediate jump to commercialization, but that is not always where you have to start. You have to start with some of the basic research and it's a very difficult process. 
one of the other things is that funding through the NIH and through a lot of grant programs is a bias against risk. Longevity research requires you to make some risky scientific decisions. You have to try things. You have to be prepared to fail. Failure is not rewarded. And first, we should also consider what is failure? Does a null hypothesis equate to failure? No, it doesn't. It's, that's how science works. You create your hypothesis, you test it, it either is true or false, and you move on. That null hypothesis is not failure, it's not a lack of value, it actually has some benefits. So let's talk about why decentralized science. Depending on your, on your view, A16Z, as you can see here, has a slightly, slightly spicier take on it. But basically, the intention of decentralized science is to figure out how to unleash knowledge. It's, there's a lot of information and a lot of data that never sees the light of day because there's no incentive to make that data available. So researchers sometimes are redoing work or don't have access to answers, spending money that they could be using on different things if only they had access to it. So what are the things that decentralized science are trying to resolve? The first one is data sharing for high fidelity. So when it comes to artificial intelligence and machine learning, you've probably heard quite a bit about it. But the effectiveness of artificial intelligence and machine learning for drug discovery, for example, is based on the quality of data. It's garbage in, garbage out. And if you don't have good data sets, it doesn't matter how brilliant your algorithm is, it doesn't matter whether it's a Monte Carlo simulation, simulated annealing, there's all kinds of different techniques, but the data's gotta be there to work with. And so one of the things that, although the promise of AI and drug discovery is excellent, we have to get them good data, and that is a challenge. If you think about genomic research, almost everybody who does research uses the UK Biobank. Why? Because it's the only really high quality data set that there is, and there's only 500,000 samples. So that's the first element. The second element I alluded to previously, and that's open publishing. So pu the publishing industry has become gatekeepers to academic progress. If you can't get your citation, if you can't get your paper published, that's a problem. So you've probably all heard of preprint servers. These preprint servers, you can put your paper on there, it's available, people can look at it. And so one of the things that DSI intends to do is to make it so that people can review these papers more frequently. And Vita Dow has actually started a thing called the Longevist, which is actually an overlay journal. It basically takes the best papers each quarter from the preprint servers and it is voted on. And we have a, a number of curators who actually review these papers and vote on them. So that's one example of there's no publisher involved, there's no Springer, there's no Wiley. This is just being done purely off pre servers and it is a community evaluation. So the editorial board is the voting community from it. So I think one of the questions a lot of people ask is why should I care about Web3 and DSI? So there's really sort of four points. Funding is much easier in the DSI and the Web3 world, and I'm gonna explain why that's the case. Principal investigators can build a community around their work. Data has financial value irrespective of outcomes, and this comes back to the null hypothesis discussion. And research becomes a direct-to-market asset class, and I'll explain that in a little more detail. So, for those of you who don't know much about VitaDAO itself, VitaDAO funds early-stage longevity research. We take research that comes straight from a lab or from a principal investigator long before any venture capitalist will ever even look at it. And we de-risk that by providing funding to get it through the initial stages to do the de-risking. So how we do that is we've actually raised money from in what is in fact the cryptocurrency uh, environment and, and the group. And basically we take that, those funds, fund the research, and the results of that research gets wrapped up in something called an IP NFT. So you think of NFTs, you think of pictures, you think of sort of artistic endeavors. But in this case, this is actually a way to wrap patents, data, and all of the information that you would typically include within a research project 
and put it on chain so that it can be verified and reviewed. And these IP NFTs are considered assets. So why is that important? Well, once you have an IP NFT as an asset, you then can fractionalize that asset. And that as and basically allow a community of interest. So for example, let's say the asset was something to do with diabetes or cardiovascular disease, you could actually raise funding and have a community of interest around your particular project. And VitaDAO just recently did the very first one, uh, which we launched something called the VitaFast token. And this is specifically to the Victor Korolchuk lab. We have other IP NFTs, uh, Morton Shabadutsen's lab and several others that have IP NFTs. What this did was it, allowed, it basically provided a mechanism to raise funding for the Victor Korolchuk lab around this specific project. Basically, we opened it up, created a token and said, who is interested in helping advance this research? And we were able to raise money for that. And this can be an ongoing process that allows a principal investigator to raise money for a particular piece of research. No grant applications, just simply create an IP NFT, mint tokens to say who is interested in supporting us. And so that's a rather novel way of using blockchain and Web3 to raise funding. A couple of things I just wanted to talk about for VitaDAO, because I've, I've heard this over the past several months. Um, one of the things VitaDAO is not, we're not a venture capitalist. Uh, some people think, oh, you're a funding agency, you must be a VC. No, we're not. We're actually more like an endowment. Our job is to get you through what we call the valley of death, from concept through to a point that if there is funding to be had, say, from a VC, our job is to get you through there. And one of the ways that we do that is by having a community of people who are PhDs and, and people within the researchers within the field help evaluate the projects as a community, not one or two VC associates and, and a few close advisors, but actually you know, a, a larger, much larger community. And that actually provides a better research design in the long run because sometimes the feedback comes back to researchers uh, to you know, maybe consider how you're gonna do your research. This might be a better way of doing it. So you refine it before you do the research, you help them de-risk it, and then the next thing is, how do we help you move your research onto the next phase? And that could be an IP NFT fractionalization. In some cases, it could be commercialization. And so that brings me to one of the key things that I think uh, we have to consider in this field. And that is how we do leadership and servant leader, as I refer to it. And I wouldn't be a Canadian if I didn't have a hockey reference here. Um, one of the things that's very obvious is that there's sort of two parallel paths within our, within our field. Uh, the researcher path, and then there's sort of this awareness outreach support group. People, those of us who are not PhD researchers, we're not, we're not gonna be the ones that develop the drugs. And so one of the, the points here is that Wayne Gretzky was, for those of you who know anything about hockey, was one of the best scorers in the game, but he always had a, a sidekick, and the sidekick was Mark Messier, and in the early days, David Semenko, whose whole job was, get people out of my way. Give me the tools that I need. And that is, quite frankly, what I think a lot of us in this room, certainly a lot of people in VitaDAO, view as our role. Our job is to make it so that the researchers can actually get to doing actual research and delivering the results. So, the other thing that I want to talk about as well is messaging. One of the things that I think is kind of confusing in this space is that the communicating the value of the longevity field has not reached maturity yet. Um, and quite often when researchers try to explain the field, um, it's, it's sometimes complicated because they, they're thinking of all the different nuances and most people just want a soundbite. It's not easy to communicate well. And sometimes when they do communicate well, their peers kind of come down on them for being, you know, too simplified, oversimplifying or overpromising. And I think that's something that people outside of the research community, certainly the, on the awareness side, I know Aubrey de Grey has done a lot of work and Methuselah Foundation and others, 
over the past 20 years, we've had to evolve, we have to evolve that thinking and, that, and sort of the narrative that goes with that. Um, a little statistic that I thought I'd share. Uh, this year we did a public survey. So this was no, it's, it's outside the bubble, it was just general survey within uh, the public and asked them, what do you know about longevity science? 74% knew nothing about it. What was even more shocking is that 14% of the respondents identified as being in the medical field. So th these are medical practitioners who talk to actual patients and do not know what longevity science is. So we have a lot of work to do and I think that that is something worth noting. Now, coming to, um, coming to uh, Keith's previous point on messaging, um, I think one of the things that is going to be important as we go through the next 10 years uh, is in addition to doing all the things we do for the research community is dealing with the messaging in a way that is addressable and understandable to a more open group. Because if you want more funding, if you want more support, you have to be able to explain your value proposition. And it's interesting, you'd think that it's obvious, but it's not. It's surprising how many people do not get it. Um, even things like uh, Jay Olshansky, when he came up with the longevity dividend, that's been around for at least 15 years. And yet people still don't understand why it is so important for longevity science to go advance because of the amount of money it would save not only governments but individuals. And, and, and of course the obvious thing being life. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, please, I sh uh, Stephanie will get mad at me if I don't mention, we are doing a workshop upstairs 12 to 1 over the next two days. Please drop by. We're happy to talk to you about VitaDAO. We're happy to talk to you about uh, some of the things that we're doing. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>